let's talk about sex, baby. The 19th century had a very prudish and uptight attitude about sex. Although prostitution thrived and the new medium of photography saw the birth of pornography, the middle-class Victorian mindset believed sex to be an incredibly taboo subject. Genitalia was particularly distasteful to the 19th century, and women's genitalia was subject to particular prudery. Um, I have read accounts of 19th century wedding nights where the, the man, the groom, has truly and honestly never even seen an image, a drawing of a vagina, so had no idea what he was going to encounter, and the woman had certainly never seen even an image or a drawing of a penis. This is the Victorian mindset. It was all very distasteful. And by the 1850s, fashion, of course, responded with this, the hoop skirt. And you thought the 1830s were ridiculous, right? Again, let's quash that childbearing hip smith. Hoop skirts had absolutely nothing to do with women wanting to show they had childbearing hips. I have no idea why people think this, because there is certainly not a scrap of evidence that suggests that this is what the hoop skirt was meant to suggest. It's not. No. The hoop skirt was the sartorial expression of Victorian prudery. It not only kept a lady's private parts at a safe distance from the outside world, it stopped men getting too close to her. And uh, we have some evidence that certainly suggests that this is what the hoop skirt was really all about. This is a contemporaneous cartoon of this gentleman here trying to shake hands with this lady, but he can't get anywhere close to her hand because of her hoop skirt, so he's kind of balancing with his umbrella on that lamp post. Totally ridiculous, but it makes the point, doesn't it, about what the hoop skirt was really about. And look at this cartoon. <laughs> this uh, guy is giving this lady an hors d'oeuvre. In fact, uh, all around the men are holding sort of snacks or hors d'oeuvres on these very long spoons or platters because they can't get anywhere near to the woman. These are satirical cartoons, of course, but they certainly speak to what the hoop skirt was really subconsciously about. Hoop skirts at the time and now were known as crinolines. Okay, in the 1830s and 1840s, the word crinoline was starting to be used, but these were simply stiff petticoats. We looked at those in the 1830s that incorporated horsehair crin that gave skirts volume like this. Yet by the 1850s, the cage crinolines, and I think that the clue as to the real purpose of the crinoline is in the name, cage crinolines, were ubiquitous. And they looked like this. The shape of the crinoline uh, changed a little between the 1850s and the 1860s. You can see the change in shape here, right? The 1850s, the cage crinoline. The 1860s, the elliptical cage crinoline. You can see the emphasis and the shape starts to veer out at the back. This is a dress from the 1850s, a cage crinoline. And here we have one from the 1860s, an elliptical cage crinoline. You can see the difference in shape, right? Everyone who was fashionable wore a hoop skirt, wore a crinoline. Young women, children, toddlers. Oh my goodness, she might be the cutest thing we've looked at all semester. They were ubiquitous. Everyone wore crinoline. So, let's do an anatomy and witness firsthand how mid-19th century fashion utterly desexualized a woman. So let's start with a beautiful naked lady. There she is. 
She's lovely. Let's make her totally unsexy. First of all, let's give her some pantalettes. Then a shift. Then a corset, tightly laced. Over that, let's just protect everything and keep all of this business at a distance with her crinoline, over which went a petticoat. And then a high-necked and really quite ugly dress. Please note her sleeves. They are called bishop sleeves. Bishop sleeves. Then let's give her arguably one of history's most unflattering hairdos and a bonnet. And there we have it. Suddenly our beautiful sexy naked lady doesn't look quite so sexy anymore, does she? And this is how women dressed. Look at that haircut. And again, a good example of the bishop sleeve. The erogenous zone was the shoulder. Um, the one uh, moment of sexy sartorial expression a Victorian woman was allowed during the 1850s and 60s was evening wear, ball gowns, evening dresses, and the erogenous zone was the shoulder. So you will see a lot of low-shouldered or off-the-shoulder gowns, like this one. You still have the crinoline there, but uh, this is very risque. It's showing a lot of shoulder. This is showing less shoulder, but you see the idea here. And again, check out uh, the crinolines. These are actually quite pretty dresses. As soon as you uh, pull these gowns off the shoulder, then suddenly the crinoline almost seems kind of sexy, doesn't it? But for day, not sexy in my opinion at all. And because there's nothing like reviving a bad idea, and fashion loves to revive bad ideas, here are some recent runway that have embraced the concept of the crinoline. Yeah, like anyone is ever going to wear this. But restrictive and ridiculous as this moment in fashion was, there were women who were ready to push for dress reform. Amelia Bloomer being the most famous. She thought crinolines were quite ridiculous and restricted a woman's life. And so she and her followers did something shocking. They wore these sort of billowy harem pants almost, uh, as depicted here, with short or shorter knee length uh, jackets. These billowing trousers were called bloomers in her honour. There were very few women who dressed like this, very few. However, it's interesting to note that there were women who were willing to make themselves extremely unpopular with the mainstream by pushing for dress reform. Imperialism raises its fashion head again during this period with this, the pagoda dress. The pagoda dress was a gown fashioned upon tears, and these tears are called flounces. Here is another example of a pagoda dress. This is a pagoda. A pagoda is a tiered building found in Asia. And you have guessed it, this period marks the colonization by England, Spain did it too, and the Dutch of various nations in Asia and Southeast Asia. Britain even colonized Hong Kong. So this, again, is imperialism in fashion. Fashion is not an island. What is it? It is a response. And just in case you don't completely get why these are called pagoda dresses and why they are all about imperialism, take a look at the grey dress on your right and see that these flounces and this shape corresponds to a pagoda. Take a look at the sleeves, the pagoda sleeves on the pink dress to your left. Again, you see the pagoda. And here is a photograph of somebody in a pagoda dress. And here are some recent runway that sort of embrace the, these flounces 
found on pagoda dresses. Another imperialist expression in fashion was paisley. Paisley was so popular, every woman in the Victorian era owned a paisley shawl. You also found paisley design and paisley print on dresses. And just to remind you close up, this is a paisley print. It wasn't actually initially called Paisley. It uh, became known as Paisley because there is a town in Scotland that was particularly good at weaving Paisley print and embroidering Paisley and designing Paisley. And the town, you may have guessed it, is called Paisley. But Paisley comes from India. This is an Indian and a Persian motif. So again, imperialism, right? And here is a portrait from this era of a woman wearing a paisley shawl. But imperialism also defined male facial fashion. When we think of the Victorian man, we think of mustaches, these huge extravagant handlebar mustaches. Every man from the mid 1800s until the end of the century sported a moustache and or whiskers, these huge fluffy sideburns. Wow! And again it'll come as no surprise during an era when Britain has had utterly taken over the subcontinent, India. This came from India. This is how Indian men did facial hair with these big whiskers and mustaches. Imperialism. It was everywhere, truly everywhere in this era. I'm not saying imperialism is back, but uh, recently hipsters have re-embraced this exaggerated Victorian beard, mustache, sideburn thing. It's quite spectacular, but rather silly. I haven't really spoken much about menswear in the past 10 or 15 minutes because, you know what, there's not much to say. The frock coat would replace the tail coat for all occasions other than evening, but check this out. The 1850s, the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s, and the 1890s. There's not much difference here, is there? Yes. Uh, the frock coat was longer in some eras, shorter in, the, in others, but it's basically the same idea. I told you the 19th century is when men stopped doing fashion. So, which decade does this suit come from, do you think? Well, if we take away the top hat, if we take away the handlebar moustache, if we put it in a modern setting and return it to its real colour, this is a suit from today. Men's fashion has not essentially changed in almost 200 years. Poor guys. Alright, I want to talk to you about something called antebellum. Antebellum, I know you've heard the word, because I'm sure you have all heard of the band Lady Ante Antebellum, right? But how many of you know what antebellum means? I would hope that hearing the, the name of the band Lady Antebellum, that some of you may have been curious enough to look the word up to find out what it means. Those of you who didn't, look stuff up. If you hear a word and you don't know what it means, look it up. Learn. I always do. I'm always hearing words. I don't know uh, what they mean. I look it up. Antebellum is from the Latin. Ante means before and bellum means war. Antebellum before the war. Which war? The American Civil War. And antebellum refers to architecture, art, fashion and lifestyle originating in the Deep South in the North American Southern States before the Civil War. We usually use the term to refer to architecture, these very elegant and grandiose plantation houses. Very often they were white and built uh, on the 
Greek orders, but with verandas and terraces and balconies like this. Antebellum fashion is much the same as you would find uh, in the rest of the Western world, only even more feminine, more flounces, more lace, all very pretty and really very, very different to how people dressed who financed all of this or who whose work financed it. Slaves. It's amazing to me that I can now show you photographs of slaves in North America because I think you're getting a sense now after all we've been through in this course that this is recent history. Recent enough for us to have photographs. Like this one. And like this one. Look at these two children. And you can see they're in, I don't know what kind of plantation that is, tobacco I think maybe. But this is uh, how slaves would dress. And I think that in a history of fashion and global attire, it would be shameful if I didn't point out that at various points in history, including this one, there were people to whom fashion was so beyond the realms of their daily existence. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Take a look at this photograph of this man. Look at his back. These are scars from a lifetime of whipping.